when I got my first TV show, uh, I was 29 turning 30. So mm-hmm. notice my relationship with money. Like, it was scarce and it was scary. Then I get my first TV show, but that was like a creative lottery. Hi, I'm Chris Lamb. This is the Money Hole Podcast, where we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly of the pursuit of wealth. Please make sure to like, subscribe, download, and give us a five-star review. And today, I'm with a good friend of mine, David Neronia. It's good to be with you, man. David, tell us just a little bit about who you are. Yeah. My background is as an actor. I lived in LA for 16 years um, and then just had a massive turn of life events that brought me up to a sweet little mountain town and I've got four kids, but yeah, I've spent most of my life in the entertainment industry. Awesome. Yeah. Well, one of the questions I've been wanting to ask you for a while is tell us a little about, a little bit about your, how you were brought up specifically your parents, their relationship with money, how that affected you. I was thinking about that today because I knew I'd be hanging out with you. And I, so something that some, my close friends know about me is that uh, I come from teenage parents. So my dad was 15. My mom was 17 when I was born. My dad was so young. He wasn't allowed to actually like go up and see me be born that he needed parental wow. consent. So suffice it to say that it was babies raising babies. And, you know, we were working class immigrants. Uh, my grandfather emigrated from Cuba in 1959, 1960, actually running away from Castro because they, they actually wanted, Castro wanted to kill my grandfather. Uh, he had been, Whoa. His, yeah, his employees had been accused of bombing, um, you know, the country. That's wild. Yeah. So he escaped through like the sewer system over the Panamanian embassy, came over, worked multiple jobs, and then eventually brought over my mom. My dad's side had a slightly different story. They came about a year later, but suffice it to say, like our roots are immigrant culture. So working hard, Mm -hmm. but not a lot of understanding of, of money at all, man. So my parents lived paycheck to paycheck Um, my dad worked for my grandfather in the construction business, you know, probably for minimum wage. And when I was thinking about coming on the show, I have so many memories of my parents' relationship with money specifically. This is what they would do back in the day. You could go to the grocery store Mm -hmm. and you could cash a check. And my parents knew that it would take the grocery store two to three days for the money to pull from the account. So if they were running short on Wednesday, but payday was on Friday, we go to Publix, they'd uh, write a bad check knowing that the grocery store wouldn't pull, uh, you know, so that we could get groceries. Yeah. So that that's like, <laughs> that's my family's relationship with money in a nutshell. Okay. Well, so tell me a little bit about uh, how that affected you. And um, obviously, you know, experiencing that growing up, yeah. going through high school, most high schools don't teach people about financial management nope. by design. And, uh, you know, in fact, the first thing you hear about senior year is student loans. Yep. And so, you know, where was there a fork in the road for you where you saw that there, there was a different way than what you were used to or what you experienced? Well, there was definitely some pitfalls along the way, a ton of them. Um, but you're absolutely right. I didn't learn a lick about money. My parents didn't know. I mean, they, they would, you know, what I learned was that there were checks and you would balance your checkbook and, you know, I would watch That was my normal. Mom. Yeah. And, you know, she would yeah. balance it and hopefully we had 50 bucks left in the account. That, like that was a good week. We had Christmases where we didn't have gifts and, you know, I mean, it was tough. So money for me, I think on a basic level though, I, I wasn't, I wasn't conscious of this was, it was scary and it was scarce. There's a lot of emotion around it. Oh, huge. Yeah. Like a lot of anxiety, Mm -hmm. a lot. Like I remember my, my dad driving to my grandmother's to borrow like five bucks for gas so that he could get to work. So I go and I decide of all things on this earth to become is to become an actor, which is not necessarily financially stable. But one of my first experiences was as a freshman at Carnegie Mellon University. a a university that I was lucky to get into, but I Mm -hmm. could not afford. So, you know, a lot of financial aid, a lot of scholarships and stuff. So a lot of free money. But I remember my freshman year, I'm 17 years old and I get my first, this envelope in the mail with this credit card thing. Mm. And they're offering me like, I think it was 400, 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. Suffice it to say, by the time I graduated college, I think I had racked up probably 15 grand back in 94. 
Which was a lot back then. A lot, <laughs> a lot. In addition yeah. to my student loans. And yeah. I, it, it was common for me to literally transfer one credit card to another 0% APR for 12 months. Yep. And I wasn't able to pay that off until I got my first TV show. Okay. So what was, uh, t- tell me about, cause I, I've known you for a while yeah. and I, I know that that's not the reality you live in today. Not today. So where was a place where you realized that, wait a minute, this isn't mm-hmm. what I want. And even though you didn't know what you didn't know, like when was that point for you where you realized that there's a different way to do things? It took me a really long time. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that story about credit cards, that's 17, you know, uh, when I got my first TV show, uh, I was 29 turning 30. So Mm -hmm. notice my relationship with money. Like it was scarce and it was scary. Then I get my first TV show, but that was like a creative lottery. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden now I'm making money, you know, monopoly money, TV money. You know, I think on my first show, I was making 50 grand a week or something like this. So you go from nothing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wrote the check for my scholarship, paid off, credit card Mm -hmm. paid off. Now I will say this, my wife and I, never went out and bought like a super fancy car. I think like our first car was like a minivan or something for the kids. Okay. Like I never bought the Beamer. I never bought this. We bought a little house uh, that we would fix up along the way. So the first TV money that I got, I paid off a ton of debt and I thought, okay, I'm being responsible. Yep. I bought a house with what was left over when the TV show got canceled, yeah. which was another lesson I needed yep. to learn was like monopoly money comes, monopoly money goes. Yes. Bought the house though. And that was probably my first key smart investment. I remember it was right when we got pregnant with my eldest son, Zion. My wife and I were so excited that we actually slept out uh, outside in our backyard, our first backyard <laughs> on an inflatable mattress yep. under the stars. Cause yep. it's like, we could, um, that house was probably the first smart thing I did, man. So, and that for you, the, you know, the opportunity, the decision that you made to buy that house was really sort of an epiphany for you because I'm, I'm assuming it, you saw that I, we take our dollars, we put it in real estate that goes up in value. So for you, that was definitely a clue for you guys as you were, you know, navigating this new life of having a family acting, making more money than you'd ever made before. Yeah. Cause you know, that's not true for everyone. You know, a lot of people, obviously they get a lot of money and they don't necessarily buy a house with it. You yeah. Know? I think, but here's, you know, what's interesting, man. And I've never really thought about this. The reason I didn't go crazy was cause I was still scared. Mm. So it was like, It was responsibility, but underneath it was a lot of fear, Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, insecurity about it. It wasn't like I became more secure. I mean, thankfully I didn't do something stupid with it, but it doesn't mean that I was feeling secure about it. The next TV show that I got, uh, I, I, I did several and on the last one was when we finally decided that we'd actually start to fi- fix this house up. Cause it was in LA. Yep. It was back where they used to, these little houses that were built during world war two. So it was like a three, one. So I took, I think I took about 150 grand and which was a big chunk of the money that I was making. And, but we fixed up the house. So we added a room, we did this to it. We did that to it. Shortly thereafter, when the show got canceled, I got super nervous that I had done like a really stupid thing. Mm -hmm. I would find out in the future, it's that decision safeguarded me to be able to sell my house in a pretty down market and still hold on to a fair amount of my equity and not lose my pants. So some of it was just luck. It was. Yeah. (laughs) Totally. God's favor in your life. Yeah. Um, You know, it's interesting. When I got into business coaching 12 years ago, the, a lot of people ask me why, and it wasn't because I wanted to necessarily make more money. I was making more money than anyone in my family had ever made. Wow. It was because I was afraid of money. Huh. And they, this particular group that I'm a part of, they're called the core. You know, one of the things they do is they have you do a personal family budget every month and they hold you accountable to how you spend your money. Wow. And so I knew that accountability was something that was valuable because it had helped me in so many other areas of my life. And so, and I had never heard of anyone where it's like, you actually look at how I spend my money every month. So that was my biggest motivator was fear. And through that, you know, it changed for me, but I think that's a common thing for people is they have so much fear around money, fear. They're not going to have enough, uh, fear of what to do with it. They're on one side of the spectrum. What do you think about that? I think it's true, man. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I don't think my relationship with money fundamentally started changing from like the inside out 
where I was actually becoming conscious of what was happening mm -hmm. till maybe about five or seven years ago. And I just turned 50. Um, it's been a long emotional journey yeah. to try to unwind. I mean, I remember sometimes we couldn't pay our rent and my parents, God bless them because they were teenagers. They were so scared to go to the door. I mean, you think about this now and it's like, they probably call child protective services or something, but like they, they knew that they'd get more crap from the landlord mm -hmm. if they went to the door for being late than if they sent their kid. Yeah. So quite often they would give me the check and I would have to walk to the door. So there's just, you know, there was a lot for me to yeah. untie. I mean, I'm not mad at them for it. I mean, you know, they were scared teenagers, but, yeah. but it was, you know, yeah, there was a lot, there was a lot in there. I think what started to change for me is uh, around the age of 40, I went kind of through a spiritual, you know, upheaval, like awakening. And I was 39 turning 40 and I came up to this little mountain town, Reading, where we live uh, to go to the school of ministry. I actually had to sell that same house in LA. Okay. And this was kind of a cool, I don't know that I had experienced, I had experienced God's provision, but not like under like tension. We knew that we had to leave LA. The business just wasn't satisfying us financially. Things were drying up for me uh, for the first time ever mm -hmm. in my career. And I remember that my wife and I knew that we were going to sell the house and I was going to come up here and go to the school, the school of ministry up here. It was a down market. And I, and my wife was so confident because she's so prophetic and, and she just really trusted the Lord in a way mm -hmm. that I hadn't gotten to yet that she said to me, we're going to get more than asking price. Now, this would have been back in 2011, 2012. Okay. And so I'm thinking right of, at the bottom of the market. Oh, dude, I'm thinking, babe, we'll be lucky if we can sell this house and not lose sure. our pants. She was right. I was wrong. And this is the only thing that I heard from the Lord. I was painting, mm -hmm. you know, getting the house ready. Yep. And I, and I was listening to, to a, like a podcast to preach or something. And I said, Lord, you got to help me out. And he said, just do what I've put in front of you. Wow. I was on a 15 foot ladder painting a wall and I had a roller brush in front of me. And I said, this, like meaning the paintbrush. Wow. And he said, just paint the wall. Trust me. And I think about a week later, we got 25 grand more than asking. Wow. And that money was what actually got my family through me going to school in this whole mm -hmm. change of life. Mm -hmm. For me, I think the pivoting thing was trusting the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. When I, so I, I went to an event one time and I, I realized that I had this belief system that yeah. was there. It was that I couldn't serve God and have money at the same time. Yeah. It's common. A lot of people deal with that. Yeah. And the Lord, I felt like the Lord had spoke to me and said, the truth is the opposite mm -hmm. of that. And I was like, well, what's the opposite of that? And it was something along the lines of through stewardship of financials, you will learn to experience me in a way that you would not any other way. Because it does require you to trust him, whether you're broke and you're hoping for that meal or whether you have abundance. Like if you're not putting it in his hands, I, I make a mess of it. And, and a lot of people do too, obviously. So, you know, on the other side of, of selling the house down there, coming up here, you know, moving your whole family to a, a bizarre place like Reading. <laughs> um, what is your, you know, with everything you learn, like what do you hope for, for the future when it comes to uh, investing or financial freedom? Like what's your, your plans, your thoughts on that? Cause a lot of people don't think about that. And it's something I talk about every day with people to try to get them to, well, that's how we got to know each other, man. I mean, we had just moved here yep. and I think you helped us with, with our, our first, if not one, more, more than one loan. I think I still feel, maybe I'm not like a baby, but I definitely feel like I'm going through a puberty in terms of my relationship with money. It's actually through a good friend of mine, Fab, who you've interviewed. It was actually his experience, his wisdom with property they got me to try something that honestly, I saw him trying to do it with another good friend of ours. And I was like, man, I, I just makes me so seems nervous. risky. It feels super <laughs> risky. We had our house. I'm like, I'm fine. Let me just stay put, man. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to pay this thing off. Now I didn't have a lot of cash, but he had a lot of experience. And he says to me, you know, he, he showed me this proposition about this one building. Now I could not for the life of me, see how this property was a good idea. I joke. Cause one of the rooms looked like a torture chamber for a serial killer, <laughs> but this guy, he, you know, Fab, he has such vision for for spaces. It's like, he could walk through this. Like he could see it. And all I saw was like Dexter. Like I saw yeah. like a murder chamber and he's like, no, no. And this and this, and we can do this, man. And then we literally bought that property for almost no money. Well, all I could bring to the table, honestly, I didn't have any cash, but I had great credit <laughs> and he was an international. 
Yeah. So I thought, well, okay, well, you've got the smarts. I've got the credit. If we put both of those things together, we might be able to buy this thing. Yeah. That one property, first of all, doing it with a brother, mm -hmm. I had to humble myself. I had to acknowledge that I was afraid. And then I actually had to ask in some ways for help and go, all right, man, look, I'm nervous, but he said, no, no, I've, I've done this before. So I threw in my credit. He threw in his expertise. We bought that one building, that one building. And I, it's too elaborate to get into how that one building, that one purchase literally unlocked a portfolio of like 10 to 12 properties. Yeah. I still kind of pinch myself. I'm like, I don't know how this happened. Yeah. Except we saw the Lord just multiply. Yeah. Like this one little faithful step. Mm. Pop, 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 pop. Me, what I want, I want to be able to take my wife certain places, but beyond that, I want to leave something behind to my kids. Yeah. Gener just, generational, uh, wealth generational wealth. Generational wealth. Yeah. You know, Fab has taught me a thing or two about resourcefulness. Um, I, honestly. Yeah. I mean, I, it's yeah, the things that he's done has really opened my eyes to, it's never a lack of resources. It's a lack of resourcefulness for most of us, you know? So David... I find myself in the weirdest place. I barely graduated high school. My life's crazy. I come out of addiction. I've been sober 19 years. Wow. I, my family, you know, my mom's incredible. It was single mom, raised me and my brothers, uh, worked to the bone. And, you know, so I did not have any financial literacy growing up at all. And like you, my story is not much different. But it, at some point through being in the industry that I'm in and you know, working with thousands of people over 22 years, I started seeing these clues, like the ones you're talking about, where uh, I see these stories in people's lives. You know, you see people that um, manage their wealth and invest it and how it benefits their life. And then you see people who really struggle with it for lots of reasons, right? And and what it does to their their family. I think the number one or at least two number for divorce is, or is because of people's money. Absolutely. You know, it's kids and money usually. That's why people get divorced. And so I feel like I've just kind of stumbled into this purpose that I, I am very passionate about on how to help the middle class accumulate wealth without any college degrees, without having to have the skills by hard work and making good decisions with money. And I, I guess the question I would ask you is, but with everything you've learned, you've got an amazing story. What would you say to yourself 20 years ago, you know, middle-class family, young kids that you've learned and, and what would, what advice would you give yourself 20 years ago? Don't play the lottery. Mm. Like I, it's, what's crazy is I've, I've never been a fan of gambling. I hate it. Um, I think I played the slots once and I was like, this is the most depressing, <laughs> stupid freaking thing Oh, you never ever. played blackjack though. It's actually pretty this, Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, I'm, that I'm told is pretty fun. Um, all of that kind of, you know, but, but I did, but I would see my Cuban grandmother do the, you know, the scratch offs. Oh yeah. Now God bless her, man, because she was a praying woman. She won twice. <laughs> she won like five grand <laughs> twice. So she did pretty, she did pretty, she did all right. My abuelita. But here's what I, though I didn't play the lottery and I didn't necessarily gamble. Yeah my view of my career yeah. was lottery mentality. And what I mean by that is literally my wife still has to remind me, she's like, stop thinking that it has to be pilot season. Mm -hmm. So pilot season for an actor is the big kahuna. It's all about just landing the big fish. It's not about just fishing one little fish at a mm -hmm. time. My mentality was always, I'm going to get the big show. Now the, the, the problem is, speak of addiction, when you taste that funny money, three times like that. Yeah. And you've sat there and you've signed the contract where they're literally like, Hey, for the next seven years, we're going to pay you 70 grand every eight business days. And you sit in your trailer, you memorize some words, everybody dresses you. They treat you like a little prima donna. You, you start to formulate this concept of money of, Oh, my next show, my next show. It almost becomes like my next yeah. hit, my next yeah. hit, my next hit. The problem is you're not, you're working to get monopoly money but you're not stewarding and building wealth yeah. slowly and methodically. So what would I say to my young self? I'd be like, stop trying to win the lottery. And if you do get a big chunk, think about the long game, like mm -hmm. the slow game. Like now I'm thinking about just, you know, these properties building up over time. Base equity. hits. That's right. Just base yep. hits, man. Pop, pop, pop. Yep. Just get to first, get to second, bring yep. the next guy home. I, I wish I would have understood the power of time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, time is, I mean, compound interest is a real thing. The rule of 72. And what is that? The rule of 72, it, it's basically the way that multiplication works with compound interest. And okay. so when you, in, if you invest money and in you dollar cost average, let's say in the S and P 500 every 10 years, because of how compound interest works, it should double. Wow. Right. So it ends up being this curve that the long game is the way to build wealth. Because once you get into those, you know, those latter years, 30 years into it, it just, it literally goes up exponential. And that's true for real estate too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've seen, I've had several clients who have built up portfolios, 20, 30, 40, 50 properties. And when they bought their first house, they were living on a teacher's income. Wow. You know, their second house took them two years to get. Their third house they got in a year and a half. Their fourth house they got in a year. Their fifth house they got in six months. Pop, pop. Then all of a sudden- they're just, they're buying properties or paying properties off. They're taking new loans out that they couldn't qualify five years ago because they now have a yeah. cash net worth and real estate. And so that's kind of how that, that works. One of the things I've noticed, and, and you being in Hollywood, you saw this firsthand, is I've seen a lot of very rich people who are miserable. Yep. And they have completely unbalanced lives. They may have a, a Lambo and fly around on jets, but they're you know, divorced, their kids are in counseling and never see them. And I've always known to myself, like, I want to have it all in life. And, you know, in the beginning, that was a, a family, a wife, and to be financially independent, just to do a little bit better than my family. But, you know, as we get older, we start realizing, like, there's so much more to what it all is. It's mind, body, and spirit, it's connection with God, it's contribution to community, it's great relationships with people who care about us. So, the word wholeness for me is, you know, money is a big part of that. And we can't deny that and be afraid of it, as you explained so well. When you think about that word, having a whole life, I like to say it in simple terms, having it all. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? I think having it all right now, because I'm knee deep in a, in a season of life where I'm raising three teenage boys mm -hmm. and trying to figure out how to make men with a beautiful little girl kind of coming up mm -hmm. as my, you know, we, we have a, a family verse out of Ecclesiastes, a three quarted strand is not easily broken. When we had Talita, my daughter, we kind of paraphrased God's word. We, we now say a three quarted strand with a purple bow is not easily broken. <laughs> I love that. I think wholeness for me these days, man, the other day I sat down with my youngest son mm -hmm. and he started dreaming about his future about wanting to be, you know, a, a trainer or a physical therapist or stuff like this. For me, the only thing that matters is knowing that I can resource my children mm -hmm. into their destinies and their future on a better week and a better month. I'm able to give into things that maybe the church is doing mm -hmm. or to give to a missionary and knowing that I might have something, maybe being able to help my parents and take care of them, that I would, I would be able to love and bless the people around me really well. Yeah. And get to hold my girl's hand. We've yeah. been together for 25 years. Yeah. And I, I don't. I Just don't being anything. fully engaged. That's it. With everything around you. And having the time. Yeah. Having the fun, having the joy, and having the, freedom. the generosity, the freedom yeah. to do that. That's, yeah, all day yeah. long, man. That's wholeness. That's awesome. David, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, man. We'll see you soon. <laughs>